guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we will be talking about Crohn's disease and this will be part 3 in our IBD series, so let's get started. So what is Crohn's disease? Crohn's disease is a chronic inflammatory bowel disease characterized by inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. Crohn's can affect any part of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus, but it is more commonly found at the end of the small intestine. This part is called the ileum. The inflammation caused by Crohn's disease often spreads deep into the layers of the affected bowel tissue. Crohn's disease can be both painful and debilitating and sometimes may lead to life-threatening complications. So in my picture on the right, I have the different types of Crohn's disease and remember from that definition, we got quite a bit of information. The first one being that this disease causes inflammation in various spots of the GI tract and can occur from anywhere from the mouth to the anus. And it most commonly affects, however, the small intestine and mainly the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestine. From the definition, we also got that the disease does not only affect the mucosal layer, which is the innermost lining of the bowel wall, but it spreads into deeper layers such as the submucosa and the muscular layer, and in some cases, this serous layer, which is the final layer. So if we look at our little picture on the right, we can see here we have iliocolitis, which is a type of Crohn's disease, and it means that there's inflammation, colitis means the colon, and ileo comes from the ileum. So we have the inflamed ileum as well as the colon. And you can see this bit of the colon is also inflamed. Then we have ileitis alone. And this is just basically the inflammation of the ileum here. Then we can have gastroduodenal Crohn's disease. And we have part of the stomach as well as the duodenum which is inflamed. And here we have jejunal ileitis. And this is parts of the jejunum which is the second part of the small bowel. And the last part which is the ileum. And then we can have a granulomatous colitis, which means granulomas that occur in different parts of the colon. And finally, we can have perianal Crohn's, which means a Crohn's disease that affects just this terminal part of that large bowel. So what are the causes of Crohn's disease? Crohn's appears to be the result of an interaction of the following factors. Hereditary factors. One may inherit genes that make him more susceptible to developing Crohn's disease. The immune system factors. When triggered incorrectly, the immune system affects the gastrointestinal tract, causing inflammation that contributes to the development of Crohn's disease. Environmental factors. Bacteria and viruses or some identified factors in the environment may trigger an abnormal immune response leading to the development of Crohn's disease. And finally, researchers believe that people with Crohn's disease experience an overreactive immune response. As a result, the intestines become raw and inflamed, which mean red and swollen, chronically. This continuous damaging and inflammation occurs in the digestive tract and leads to Crohn's symptoms. So if you look at this little three-way bubble here, we have the hereditary factors, the immune system, and environmental factors that all solely contribute towards the development of Crohn's disease. Risk factors, age, Crohn's disease can occur at any age, but is more likely to be diagnosed before the age of 30 years old. Ethnicity Although Crohn's disease can affect any ethnic group, whites and especially Jewish individuals have the highest risk. Family history One is at higher risk if one has a close relative, such as a parent, sibling or child with the disease. As many as one in five people with Crohn's disease also has a family member with the disease. Cigarette smoking Cigarette smoking is the most important controllable risk factor for the development of Crohn's disease. Smoking also leads to more severe disease and a greater risk of having surgery. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. These include ibuprofen, naproxen sodium, and diclofenac. While they do not cause Crohn's disease, they can lead to inflammation of the bowel that makes Crohn's disease worse. One's location. If one lives in an urban area or an industrialized country, one is more likely to develop Crohn's disease. This suggests that environmental factors, including a diet high in fat or refined foods, play a role in Crohn's disease. People living in northern climates also seem to be at greater risk. So now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of Crohn's disease. Signs and symptoms of Crohn's disease can range from mild to severe, 
They usually develop gradually, but sometimes will come on suddenly without warning. One may also have periods of time when he has no signs or symptoms, meaning that the disease is in remission. When the disease is active, signs and symptoms may include diarrhea, fever and fatigue, abdominal pain and cramping, nausea and vomiting, blood in the stool, mouth sores, a reduced appetite and weight loss, perianal lesions, anemia and weight loss, feeling as if the bowels aren't empty after a bowel movement, and feeling a frequent need for bowel movements. Now let's talk about the extraintestinal manifestation of Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease may have extraintestinal symptoms or symptoms that occur outside of the intestines. This can occur up to 25% of patients diagnosed with Crohn's disease. These can include any or all of the following. Musculoskeletal manifestations such as osteoporosis, arthritis, which most commonly affects the peripheral joints, and low back pain. The integumentary manifestations include erythema nodosum or painful red bumps on the skin surface, pyoderma gangrenosum, or skin ulcerations. The genitourinary manifestations include kidney stones. Liver involvement manifestations include hepatitis, cirrhosis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, or the inflammation of the liver ducts. Appear as sores within the mouth. The ophthalmic manifestations include redness and itching of the eyes, uveitis, which means the inflammation of the uvea layer of the eye, eye pain, and or vision changes. And finally, psychiatric manifestations, which give emotional distress. Now let's talk about the macroscopic features of Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract, from the mouth to the anus. 30 to 40% of patients have small bowel disease alone. 40 to 55% have disease involving both the small and the large intestines, and 15 to 25% have colitis alone. So basically all that means is that 30 to 40% of patients have intestinal involvement only, 40 to 55% have intestinal and colonic involvement, and 15 to 25% have only the large bowel or the colon affected. In 75% of patients with small intestinal disease, the terminal ileum is involved in 90% of cases. So in 75% of patients who have their intestines involved, 90% of those 75% have the terminal ileum involved. Unlike ulcerative colitis, the rectum is often spared in Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is segmental with skip areas in the midst of the disease. Intestinal perirectal fistulas, fissures, abscesses, and anal stenosis are present in one third of patients with Crohn's disease, particularly those with colonic involvement. Rarely, Crohn's disease may also involve the liver and the pancreas. So, something to note about this disease is that it manifests with these so called skip lesions which means that it affects this part, it skips a bit, and here we have healthy tissue, and then it affects this part, and then it skips a bit, and then it affects this part. So this sort of appearance is called the skip lesion appearance. And again, because this disease can affect any part of the GI tract, we can also have it affect the oral cavity because the oral cavity is also part of the GI tract. And in the oral cavity, we can have oral swelling, uh, we can have the development of these aphthous ulcers, and in the intestines themselves, we can have these mucosal tags and within the colon usually and even parts of the small intestine, we have this cobblestone appearance. So continuing with the macroscopic features, unlike ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease is a transmural process. And basically all that means is that it doesn't just affect the innermost lining of the GI tract, which means the mucosal layer, but it also affects the deeper layers, which means the submucosa, the muscular layer, and even in some cases, the serous layer, which means if you look at this diagram all the way through this entire wall. And that is what a transmural process means. In mild disease, aphthias or small superficial ulcerations characterize in more active disease. Stellite ulcerations fuse longitudinally and transversely to demarcate islands of the mucosa that are frequently histologically normal. This cobblestone appearance is characteristic for Crohn's disease, both endoscopically and by barium radiography.
As in ulcerative colitis, pseudopolyps can form in Crohn's disease. Active Crohn's disease is characterized by focal inflammation and the formation of fistulous tracts which resolve by fibrosis and stricturing of the bowel. The bowel wall thickens and becomes narrowed and fibrotic, leading to chronic recurrent bowel obstructions. Projections of thickened mesentery encase the bowel, and this is called creeping fat, and the serosal and mesenteric inflammation promotes adhesions and fistula formation. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see the normal bowel wall, and then you can see what it looks like in active Crohn's disease. First of all, we have a thickened wall because of that active inflammatory process. And then we have these fissures, which are like these sort of penetrations into the wall of the GI tract. And then we also note the cobblestoning appearance and of course the wrapping of fat around the bowel wall. So now let's talk about the microscopic features of the disease. The earliest features of the disease include aphthous ulcerations and focal crypt abscesses with loose aggregations of macrophages which form non-caseating granulomas in all the layers of the bowel wall. Granulomas can be seen in lymph nodes, mesentery, peritoneum, liver, and the pancreas. Although granulomas are a pathognomic feature of Crohn's disease, they are rarely found on the mucosal biopsies. Surgical resection reveals granulomas in about one half of the cases. Submucosal or subserosal lymphoid aggregates are also found particularly away from the areas of ulceration. Gross and microscopic skip areas can also be noted. Transmural inflammation that is accompanied by fissures that penetrate deeply into the bowel wall and sometimes form fistulous tracts or local abscesses. So from the microscopic features, we can note the transmural ulcers, the non-caseating granulomas, the crypt abscesses, and the aphthioid ulcers. And these all can be seen microscopically when samples are taken from these injured tissues. And also in the last point, we said that the transmural inflammation can be accompanied by fissures that penetrate deeply. So this is a fissure, it's a break in that bowel wall and can sometimes lead to a fistulous tract, which is this part, as well as local abscesses. And this is what the abscess is. It is that drainage of all this inflamed pus and mucus, sort of fecal matter, food, whatever's in there. And it's gonna cause a local infection here. And you can see quite clearly how debilitating the disease can be. So now let's talk about how is Crohn's disease diagnosed. Blood tests, tests for anemia or infection. The blood test can check for anemia or for signs of infection by the number of white blood cells and acute phase proteins. A fecal occult blood test, this looks for hidden blood in the stool of the patient. Procedures, a colonoscopy, here, the entire colon is viewed using a thin, flexible, lighted tube with an attached camera. During the procedure, the doctor can also take small samples of tissue for laboratory analysis, which may help confirm the diagnosis. Clusters of inflammatory cells, called granulomas, if present, can help confirm the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. A flexible sigmoidoscopy. In this procedure, the doctor uses a slender, flexible, lighted tube to examine the sigmoid, which is the last portion of the colon. So this portion right here is that sigmoid colon and Crohn's disease can also be evaluated using a sigmoidoscopy. So continuing with the diagnostic techniques, we can also do a CT. This looks at the entire bowel as well as tissues outside the bowel. We can also do an MRI. This is particularly useful for evaluating a fistula around the anal area or the small intestine. Capsule endoscopy. Here, one swallows a capsule that has a camera in it, and the camera takes pictures which are transmitted to the computer one wears on his belt. Double balloon endoscopy. For this test, a longer scope is used to look further into the small bowel where standard endoscopes don't reach. This technique is useful when capsule endoscopy shows abnormalities, but the diagnosis is still in question. Small bowel imaging. This test looks at part of the small bowel they can't be seen by colonoscopy. After one drinks a liquid containing barium, doctors can take x-rays, CT, or MRI images of the small intestine. Below, I just put in a picture of a CT, what that process looks like. And then we have the pull cam, or the capsule endoscopy. And just to point out what features can be noted on the capsule endoscopy, 
Using this little pull cam, we can see fissuring in the bowel wall that looks like this. You can see that fissure developing there. We can also see multiple aphthous ulcers. You can see these little ulcers in that bowel wall. You can also see serpentinous ulcers, and these are them here. And we can note that cobblestoning appearance, that is a common feature of Crohn's disease. And finally, we can notice these strictures in the bowel wall. And these are all helpful in pointing us towards the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. So now let's talk about the treatments and drugs in Crohn's disease. Treatment for Crohn's disease usually involves drug therapy or in certain cases, surgery. The goal of medical treatment is to reduce the inflammation that triggers the signs and symptoms. It is also to improve the long-term prognosis by limiting complications. The anti-inflammatory drugs are often the first step in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. They include the amino salicylates, most commonly 5-SA, which is also called misalazine and sulfasalazine. Another first-line treatment for Crohn's disease are the corticosteroids. These drugs, which include prednisone and hydrocortisone, also help to reduce the inflammatory process. The immune system suppresses. These drugs suppress the immune system response that starts the process of inflammation. Immunosuppressant drugs include azathroprine, cyclosporine, infliximab, and methotrexate. Continuing with treatments and drugs, antibiotics. These drugs can reduce the amount of drainage and sometimes heal fistulas and abscesses in people with Crohn's disease. Frequently prescribed antibiotics include metronidazole and ciprofloxacin. Antidiarrheal medications. A fiber supplement such as xylem powder or methyl cellulose can help relieve mild to moderate diarrhea. For more severe diarrhea, loperamide may be effective. Pain relievers. Pain relievers such as acetaminophen can be administered. Iron supplements. If one has chronic intestinal bleeding, one may develop iron deficiency anemia and may need to take iron supplements. Vitamin B12 shots. Crohn's disease can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 helps prevent anemia, promotes normal growth and development, and is essential for proper nerve function. And finally, calcium and vitamin D supplements. Crohn's disease and the steroids used to treat it can increase one's risk of osteoporosis, so one may need to take calcium supplements with added vitamin D. Nutrition therapy. The doctor may recommend a special diet given via a feeding tube, and this is called enteral nutrition, or nutrients injected into a vein. This is called parenteral nutrition to treat the Crohn's disease. This can improve the overall nutrition and allow the bowel to rest. Bowel rest can reduce inflammation in the short term. The doctor may also use nutrition therapy short term and combine it with medications such as immune system suppressors. Enteral and parenteral nutrition are typically used to get people healthier prior to surgery or when other medications fail to control symptoms. Surgery. If diet and lifestyle changes, drug therapy or other treatments don't relieve the signs and symptoms of the disease, the doctor may recommend surgery. Up to one half of individuals with Crohn's disease will require at least one surgery. However, Surgery does not cure Crohn's disease. During surgery, the surgeon removes the damaged portion of the digestive tract and then reconnects the healthy sections. Surgery may also be used to close fistulas and drain abscesses. A common procedure for Crohn's disease is a strictureplasty, which widens a segment of the intestine that has become too narrowed. So if you look at my picture on the right here in the bottom, you can see an example of strictureplasty. The benefits of surgery for Crohn's disease are usually temporary. The disease often reoccurs and usually does so near the reconnected tissue. The best approach is to follow surgery with medication to minimize the risk of reoccurrence. So now let's talk about some complications of Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease may lead to one or more of the following complications. Inflammation. Inflammation may be confined to the bowel wall, which can lead to scarring and narrowing which is called stenosis, or may spread through the bowel wall, creating a fistula. Bowel obstruction. Crohn's disease affects the thickness of the intestinal wall. Over time, parts of the bowel can thicken and narrow, which may block the flow of digestive content. One may also require surgery to remove the diseased portion of the bowel. Ulcers. Chronic inflammation can lead to open sores, which are called ulcers, anywhere in the digestive tract, including the mouth and the anus and the genital area, which is called the perineum. 
So in my picture on the right, I showed you guys some examples of the complications that may occur in Crohn's disease. So at the top, we have a segment of normal bowel, and then we can see what happens to the bowel wall, the thickness of the bowel wall in that inflammatory process. And while the bowel wall thickens, we can also see the narrowing of that hollow tube, which is where the intestinal content has to flow through. And then we have the development of the stricture in which that inflammation becomes so intense that it causes such a narrow section now that intestinal content is unable to pass through here. We can then have obstruction, and you can see here we have a local obstruction in which the two opposite layers of the bowel wall are actually touching each other. And this creates some sort of a complete obstruction of the bowel wall. And then we can have a fistula, which means that we have a break in this bowel wall and we have a communication or a channel that opens into a neighboring organ. And this is what a fistula is. And on the right, we also have the fistula, which has complicated into an abscess. So as you can see, there's a lot of complications that are associated with Crohn's disease. Fistulas, sometimes ulcers can extend completely through the intestinal wall, creating a fistula, which is an abnormal connection between different body parts Fistulas can develop between the intestine and the skin, or between your intestine and another organ, such as the bladder or the vagina. An anal fissure. This is a small tear in the tissue that lines the anus, or in the skin around the anus, where infections can occur. It is often associated with painful bowel movements and may lead to a perianal fistula. Malnutrition. Diarrhea and abdominal pain and cramping may make it difficult for one to eat or for the intestine to absorb enough nutrients to keep one nourished. And finally, colon cancer. Having Crohn's disease that affects the colon increases the risk of colon cancer. General colon cancer screening guidelines for people without Crohn's disease call for a colonoscopy every 10 years at the beginning of age 50. So basically all that means is that in people who do have Crohn's disease, the screening has to occur a lot more frequently, mainly every two to five years. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you find all this information very useful and informative. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button, like, comment, and share. And if you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.